Now I see why you guys sent this video my way. Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. In today's video, we'll be taking another look at Sarah's day. Before we get into the video, we're gonna play a little game called Abby's Daily Hunger Crushing Combo. So I've had a very busy day and I'm hitting that 3 p.m. energy dip and I feel like I need a little something something. So let's build a hunger crushing combo. So I've got some really yummy crunchy mango chips for some antioxidants and some extra fiber. We got some pistachios here for some healthy fats, plus some fiber and some extra protein. And I'm gonna have a Bilt Bar puff for my protein. As you guys know, I love Bilt Bars because they come in a ton of different tasty flavors and they taste like real chocolate because they are made with chocolate, but they pack a ton of protein. Like this bar right here has 17 grams. Amazing. So this is the perfect hunger crushing combo snack to get me to the dinnertime rush without a hangry meltdown. Mm. So if you want to try out Built Bar yourself, check out my link in the description and use my promo code ABBYSHARP15 to get 15% off of your order. Uh, looks like someone else needs a snack too. And you can pause the screen or look at the description to check out my disclaimer, including a trigger warning to those with current or previous experiences with disordered eating. As always, feel free to skip this video if it is not supportive to your journey. And if you are not already subscribed, hit that subscribe button and follow me over on TikTok and Instagram at Abby's Kitchen. So for those of you guys who are longtime subbies of mine, you are probably no stranger to Sarah's day. As I have reviewed not only what she eats in a day, but also more recently, her health app, Sunny. I honestly thought we were done here, but judging by the overwhelming volume of emails and DMs related to some of her more recent problematic content, I was clearly wrong. So let's take a look at one of her more recent days of eating. Almond milk, barista almond milk. I'm actually going off the oat milk that I used to buy. It is really full of um, like vegetable oils. I'm trying to make everything I eat a lot more like basic and whole food. And we're already off to a not so great start. I first want to highlight the contradiction of saying that you're trying to eat more whole foods while simultaneously holding a carton of almond milk, which by the way is not a whole food and is definitely considered a processed food since there's about 2% actual almonds in most major brands. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with consuming processed foods, including almond milk. I love almond milk, but it's just always ironic when wellness influencers demonize them while simultaneously like sharing their recipes for a protein smoothie with protein powder, spirulina, nut butter, coconut water, and frozen fruit, which are all incidentally processed. This is why it's actually unhelpful to categorize foods as good or bad, because it's absolutely never black and white. Many processed foods are actually quite nutrient dense, accessible, convenient, and in some cases actually safer for consumption. But anyways, back to it. When it comes to oat milk, it is true that some oat milk brands have like sunflower or canola oil in them to improve the texture, which will naturally alter their fatty acid profile. And we hear a lot of hoopla in the wellness community about avoiding seed oils because they allegedly increase inflammation due to their omega-6 content. However, the larger body of high quality evidence suggests that omega-6 fat that's don't actually have a significant effect on inflammation. And some research even suggests that they may even reduce the risk, especially when in combination with omega-3s, which canola oil and sunflower oil also have. I also wanna point out that even though the almond milk that Sarah swapped for her usual oat milk doesn't contain vegetable oil, it does contain the emulsifier sunflower lecithin, which ironically, also contains omega-6 fats. So we end up getting in our own way when we hyperfixate on ingredients and read into misinformation, which in the grand scheme of things doesn't make or break our health, especially if we're consuming just like normal amounts. So unless you're consuming gallons of oat milk every single day and not much else, 
I don't see any major cause for concern. I just felt like I was just surviving, especially with food. Like I would have a big breakfast and then all day I just like eat off Fox's plate or like I have four muesli bars as a lunch. I just lost my passion for health. So sick of Uber Eats and I'm just sick of not giving myself time to even like have lunch or make myself lunch. Like as mothers, we sacrifice so much time for our kids that like just in the next two weeks, I'm like, I'm gonna give myself 20 minutes every lunchtime to like prepare myself a lunch and enjoy. I can totally relate to this sentiment and have been there many times myself. And I feel like oftentimes us mamas become martyrs for our children and we sacrifice so much of our basic needs and well-being to make sure that our kids have everything that they could possibly need. But then at the end of the day, you just end up pouring from an empty cup. And while I know it's really easier said than done, you have to make sure that you have your own oxygen mask on before you can put it on your kiddo. And sometimes this really just means getting down to the basics of eating three meals a day, like having a shower, moving your body, and getting a good night's sleep. So I totally feel for Sarah and definitely understand the struggle because even that, feels like an impossible task for me. But small sustainable changes really do go a long way. And I think that committing to just like 20 minutes a day to prepare a lunch is a very reasonable goal. And it honestly doesn't have to be a big ordeal. It can be as easy as like opening a can of tuna for a sandwich or boiling an egg to have with a side of veg and crackers. Getting that fuel in the tank is essential Otherwise, it's just a fast-tracked way to burn out. I got on this really good TikTok algorithm and it was all about like additives in food and like vegetable oils in your milk. And it like, it just sparked that old Sarah in me of like wanting to eat really healthy again. Not in a restrictive way, just in like a really wholesome, simple way. Leave it to TikTok to scare you from something as benign as oat milk. Also, TikTok is the most unregulated dumpster fire of nutrition bullshit. I have ever seen. So let's please not believe everything we see from a 30 second TikTok clip. There's also so much misinformation and fear mongering around food additives online, which I actually debunk in my food label series right here. And while I don't know the specifics of the information that Sarah was exposed to other than the vegetable oils, in general, most food additives are highly regulated and safe to consume in doses present in the foods that we eat. And if you ever hear that bull advice not to eat ingredients that you don't recognize or can't pronounce, please unfollow that person immediately. Because with that logic, you'll probably end up turning down products that have ingredients like ascorbic acid or calciferol, which are just synonyms for vitamin C and vitamin D respectively. And like I said, with vegetable oils, we don't have evidence to suggest that they are something that we need to completely avoid. So on the one end, I get that being stuck in a motherhood rut and seeing health information online can motivate you to like jumpstart your wellness routine. But it should ultimately be about self-care and nourishing yourself in an accessible and sustainable way. Not about controlling your food or fueling fear around minute aspects of what you're eating. Ultimately, swapping oat milk for almond milk is not going to make a significant dent in your wellness journey. The same way that something like Sarah's goal of prioritizing a 20 minute lunch to nourish your body will. I'm kickstarting Sarah's Day Wellness Week. If you go to my website, sarahsday.com, I have a bunch of free PDFs that we've made for you guys. Just the objective of this vlog and these two weeks of wellness is to inspire you guys to do something that improves your sense of wellness. We have three meal plans. I'll put them up here that you guys can access and it kind of gives you an inspiration or like it kind of gives you an idea or inspiration of like what you can eat in the week to just like mix up your diet. I love a good freebie. So of course I had to check out what Sarah's Wellness week was all about. And I actually really liked the meal plans because they served more as like food inspo rather than prescriptive advice. They also have good variety and cater to different preferences. So for example, she's got a vegan meal plan as well as a family meal plan with lots of options for breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack, and dessert. I also love how one of the PDFs literally focuses on how to fill up your cup with different prompts to check in with yourself, set intentions, and prioritize 
your basic needs like hydration, sleep, movement, hygiene, and doing something that you love. And I actually really love this simple and accessible approach to wellness because I feel like the wellness industry has quickly capitalized on a very superficial version of what it means to be well. Wellness and self-care isn't just about having like a 20 step skincare routine, wearing a matching set and going to an expensive Pilates class. Sometimes it really just comes down to the boring, non-aesthetic basics. I want my basic hot dog. And also tackling the difficult and uncomfortable stuff in between. And that might mean going to therapy and having like an ugly cry or focusing on your financial wellness or setting boundaries in your relationships. And in Sarah's case, it means taking a few minutes to prepare a meal so that you can have enough fuel in the tank to be super mom. Being well is really about your needs and what makes you thrive. It is not defined by social media or an influencer's version of wellness. It's also not about checking off an extensive to-do list of wellness activities if it leaves you feeling stressed and depleted. So I love that Sarah's Wellness Week turns the tables and encourages you to reflect on what you need rather than dishing out this really strict prescriptive advice of what you should be doing to be well. This is what I've been loving, like a berry porridge with maple syrup and yogurt. This looks like an amazing breakfast to really help power you through a day of mommy duties. We've got tons of energizing carbs from the oats, lots of staying power from the protein and the yogurt and the healthy fats from the nuts, plus topped off with some berries for fiber and micronutrients. Looks awesome. Usually on Saturdays, I go to this really intense class. It's like a full body, like CrossFit style class. But yeah, I woke up at like six and I was like, mm -mm. it's just like, that would not be honoring my body today, you know? So like the whole thing with Wellness Week is like truly listening to your body and doing what it needs. That doesn't mean forcing yourself to like go to the gym every day and like be disciplined. This girl is speaking my love language. Carbs. It's my love language. I am all for moving in a way that makes your body feel good, but you certainly don't need to go balls to the walls and like hit up an intense hit class to reap the physical and emotional rewards of moving your body. Some days, all you really need is like a gentle stretch or like a light walk, maybe even nothing at all. Nothing at all. Quit it. Ultimately, your body knows best. So I applaud Sarah for honoring herself practicing some self-care and not forcing herself through a strenuous workout when her body just isn't feeling great. Oh my gosh, this is like so invigorating making lunch. Like I literally never get to eat lunch. We love a tasty green salad for lunch and this one has the works. We're getting crispy tofu for some plant-based protein, some carbs from the quinoa and a mix of veggies. But I will say as a busy mom myself, even this salad would feel like a tall order for me, especially with all like the chopping and cooking involved. So to really streamline this process, I would probably just grab like a pre-made salad mix, add in like some rotisserie chicken, a can of tuna or canned chickpeas for protein and like serve it with five minute couscous, a pita or crackers on the side. Either way though, I think it's great that Sarah's staying committed to her goal of preparing herself lunch and making things easier for herself by prepping some ingredients ahead of the time. We play a game of like what's healthy food and what's not so healthy food, like sometimes food. What is a healthy food? Um, pineapple. Mm, yes. What is maybe a not so healthy food, a sometimes food? Chocolate. Yeah, sometimes. Watermelon healthy. Watermelon is healthy. Do you want me to have a go? Mm -hmm. Okay. A healthy food is broccoli and a sometimes food is hot chips. Mm -hmm. no, a healthy food is popcorn. Popcorn, yeah, it's okay. But like, what's healthy, what's really, really healthy? Bananas. Yes. And what's a sometimes food? How can you just have lollies? Sometimes? Yes, lollies. Now I know what all your DMs were about. I totally understand that Sarah had nothing but good intentions with this innocent seeming game, but this approach can very quickly backfire and actually do the opposite of fostering a balanced, healthy relationship with food. In fact, we have research showing that children who are restricted from certain foods 
are actually more likely to overconsume these foods when they do have access to them, which is what happens when kids grow up or they go to parties or they hang out with their friends, etc. And even though I don't get the sense that Sarah is actively restricting these foods from her kids, as she's literally just kind of made cupcakes with her son, but even the language that we use around food can make a huge impact. I also just quickly want to elaborate on this a bit because I've had a lot of time to think about it and I also don't wanna leave parents unsure of what to do instead. I also spoke to a ton of my RD colleagues who work with kids specifically and we all agreed that it is absolutely not age appropriate or arguably appropriate ever to categorize foods as healthy. I know sometimes foods feels a little more moderate, but it's still grounded in a diet culture and restriction. So what should you do instead? Just call foods what they are. Like call it a fucking lollipop, not a treat. Okay, maybe not fucking lollipop, but you get what I'm saying. Like call it a cupcake, not bad or something that they can only have some of the time. Call it broccoli, like just broccoli not a black or white health food. Of course, some foods are more nutritious than others. So if you wanna teach your kids a little bit about nutrition, I really like my colleague Kids Eat in Colors approach. So talk about what a food or food group can do for our body. You know, it gives us a strong brain. It helps fight off sickness, heal from cuts, make our heart strong. You know, ultimately nutrition is nuanced and boxing foods into black and white categories, no matter what you call them, is teaching diet culture at a very sensitive, vulnerable age. No hate to Sarah, but I just don't want other parents who are watching to think that this game is a good idea to teach kids about food. Kids will learn that if mom doesn't want me to have the lollies and the chocolate, they must be really, really special and good. Really, really, really ridiculously good looking. Well, the broccoli she's like really, really pushing hard must be gross or there's something wrong with it. Why would she care so much? Calling foods that some kids may not really like healthy teaches kids that healthy means gross. It's no different than when us adults have a forbidden bad food list, we just kind of want them even more. And as I discuss in my video on the division of responsibility, raising children to have a healthy relationship with food isn't about controlling what or how much they eat. It's actually about creating complete food neutrality and not praising or shaming one food choice over another. Our kids are born intuitive eaters. So in order to honor and preserve those skills, we need to provide a supportive environment that allows their natural self-feeding and food regulation capacities to thrive. And that just can't happen when you set limitations, rules, or even demonizing language around sometimes foods. Here's the thing about Wellness Week. It's not just about eating 100% healthy, it's about enjoying your food. Like for me, it's like 80-20. So I know that the 80-20 rule is essentially a synonym in diet culture for eating in moderation, which I think was the intended theme of this video given its title. And I agree that eating in moderation is key as we still want to make sure that we're leaving space for foods that not only nourish us physically, but emotionally as well. So I like that Sarah's intention with Wellness Week is prioritizing self-care by eating regular meals and focusing on nutrient-dense foods while also leaving space for eating cupcakes with her family. But at the end of the day, 80-20 still sets limitations around food. Sometimes our days look a little more like 20 than they do 80, and some days it's more like a 50-50 split, and both are totally okay and normal. Ultimately, it really comes down to listening to your body and honoring what it needs without needing to do like a math calculation in your head to determine the ratio of vegetables or chocolate that you're allowed to eat that day. That's good, I love it. Slow cookers are a lazy girl's bestie. So they definitely come in clutch when you are a busy mama and you maybe only have a few minutes to chop up some veg, but not enough time to like labor over a stovetop waiting for everything to cook down. So in this chicken soup, we're getting loads of veggies, some carbs from the potatoes and pasta noodles, and some protein in the chicken. And of course, I'm a big fan of a hunger crushing dessert, which provides a ton of energizing carbs from the dates. So to sum this up, what are my thoughts on Sarah's wellness week? 
Well, I appreciate any influencer who promotes an idea of self-care that isn't just a that girl routine. And for someone whose goal was just to spend 20 minutes a day cooking a meal for herself, she pulled off a pretty impressive day of eating from scratch. Good for Sarah, but for all of you watching at home just struggling to like shower every day, know that I don't think that this is a realistic goal for like 99% of us at home. I'm a YouTuber too, and there is no way in hell that I make three meals a day from scratch and vlog and bake every day or like any day. But again, if it works for Sarah and it feels like self-care to her, it absolutely works for me. My issue with this video is that there's a lot of moralizing food language and also some fear-mongering misinformation about processed foods. And I just don't think that that helps anyone who are also just trying to make baby steps toward better health. I would love to hear from you guys about your definition of self-care and the small little baby steps that you've been taking on your own personal wellness journey. And on that note, that's all that I have for you guys today. If you like this video, be sure to give it the thumbs up, leave me a comment below on what you'd like to see me review next, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye.